Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great day of PCAM. So today we're going to be taking uh, the knowledge that we've gained from Z effective about the energies of different orbitals to figure out how electrons fill up the orbitals of a multi electron system. So using our arguments of electron shielding and penetration, we can essentially order the energies of all of our electron shells and subshells. And most of you are fairly familiar with these general patterns. It goes 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, uh, 4p, 5s, 4d, 4f. Most of you know how to use a uh, uh, how to use a, a periodic table to try and identify these electronic shells. The other, and again, they'll fill up according to this nice general passion, uh, fashion. Also worth noting that based on the <coughs> angular momentum of each of these orbitals, we can figure out how of each of these subshells, we can figure out how many orbitals each of these subshells contain, with S having uh, only a single orbital, P having three, uh, D orbitals having five, and F orbitals having uh, seven. Because again, M sub L zero, M sub L plus one, minus one and zero, minus two to plus two, minus three to plus three. And then each of these orbitals contains two electrons, one up, one down. However, this again just gives us the general uh, energies and filling uh, rules. So again, I'll tend to fill up a 1s before a 2s, a 2s before a 2p, 2p before a 3s. And this will essentially guarantee that my system will be in the lowest energy possible. However, when trying to fill it up, we're going to be using Hun's rules, uh, two of which are going to be, are going to come into play. So the first of this is uh, every orbital in a sublevel should be singly occupied before any orbital is doubly occupied, which means that if I'm, say, dealing with carbon, I've got six electrons. Of course, I'm going to fill up the 1s orbital first. So I'm going to put one, uh, put two in here. Then the 2s, two more electrons. This gives me two electrons to put in the 2p orbitals. But the question is how? Do I put two of them in here? This orbital, this orbital, m sub l plus one, zero, minus one. Do I spread them out? So again, when we're talking about just simple energy filling, all of these orbitals are degenerate, so there shouldn't be an obvious choice here. However, uh, here's where essentially Hun's rule comes into play, <coughs> is that we're going to try and fill up uh, multiple orbitals before I start popping two electrons into a single orbital. So by convention, let's say I'm going to fill, put one electron in the px and one electron in the py. But then we're stuck with this interesting question. Which spin do these two electrons get? Both up, both down. And for this, we can make the use of the second of Hund's rules, which is essentially saying that an atom in its ground state is going to try and maximize the number of unpaired electrons. So this means that when I'm, say, dealing with my carbon, I'm going to, of course, because they're low energy, I'm going to pair up spins in the s orbitals but I'm going to put both of my remaining p orbital electrons pointed in the same direction. By convention, we typically choose to assign it an m sub s of plus one half, or in other words, an alpha spin or pointed up. However, in reality, it really wouldn't matter whether they're both pointed up or both pointed down because the only thing that dictates up and down is any external magnet. And since we're not typically applying a magnet to these systems, I don't know which one it adopted. So by convention, we just generally choose up. Now, here's the question. Why do we have these rules? Why do atoms essentially want to spread out all with the same spin? And it turns out, not too surprisingly, this is going to be an artifact of electron-electron repulsion. So let's say I'm going to put two electrons in these various 2p orbitals. Well, here's going to be the logical idea. If I put two electrons in the same orbital, they're essentially going to clash. They're going to both be in the same space, and this is going to 
maximize <coughs> electron electron interaction. So this is essentially called a spin pairing energy. So if I pair my spins together, one up, one down in the same orbital, they're gonna occupy the same space, which means I get way too much electron or electron repulsion. This is gonna raise the energy of my system. So in generally, my two electrons are gonna to wanna to go into different orbitals, say a PX and a PY. That'll keep their space away from each other. <clears throat> However, one of the important other principles that we need to keep in mind is that let's say that one of these electrons is up and one of them are down, but in separate orbitals. Well, this is the point at which we have to remember that PX and PY orbitals were a little bit of an artifact to begin with, because remember, these are technically a, a linear combination of plus and minus one half, which means that they tend to bleed into unoccupied orbitals if allowed to. However, because of the Pauli principle, if they've got the same spin, they can't occupy the same space. However, if they have opposite spins, well, then that restriction is relaxed and they can actually start occupying the same orbital. So they bleed together. So one of the things we're trying to do is minimize this bleed by keeping the spins all in the same direction, which would again, minimize electron-electron repulsion and keep our energy as low as possible. Because remember, atoms like to go as low as they can go when it comes to energy. So again, really this is a way to, uh, this all reflects this idea, same spins have to stay apart, uh, opposite spins bleed together. So one of those things we have to watch out for. And this general rule actually does this pretty well when talking about the S and P orbitals. However, turns out electron filling gets a little bit messy once we hit that D shell. Of course it does. It's the reason we have an entire class called inorganic chemistry, which is more or less gonna focus in on the antics of the D shell. However, we're gonna go ahead and talk about what happens when I say hit the 3B, or, uh, 3B orbitals. So this is a set, uh, reach group three, so this would be scandium. So this is where I've got two electrons in the 4s orbitals and then one electron in the 3d orbitals. And according to our z effective, we know that the <coughs> 4s orbitals should be lower uh, in energy than the 3d orbitals. However, it turns out that uh, once we enter, <coughs> once we start actually filling up the 3d orbitals, those 3D orbitals actually increase the energy of those 4S orbitals. So as soon as I go get to scandium, well, now I've got more nuclear charge. Turns out the, four, uh, turns out the 3D orbitals end up dropping below the 4S orbitals in energy. So logically, I should go ahead and uh, fill the 4 uh, 3D orbitals and the configuration of scandium should be three, uh, 3D3. However, it turns out as soon as you actually try and rearrange the electrons, move one electron down to the, uh, from the 4S orbital down to the 3D orbital, which should logically decrease the energy of the system. It turns out I've actually increased the electrostatic repulsion. So, I rearrange the orbitals such that this, uh, the where I have the 4s1, 3d2 is actually higher in energy. So it pretty much stays as uh, uh, 4s2 uh, despite the spin pairing energy. And as I increase my, uh, as I increase the number of electrons in the d orbitals, this essentially stays the case. So I'll typically fill up my 3D, uh, 3D orbitals <laughs> instead of losing an electron from the 4S. So despite the fact that the orbital energies actually put the 3D below the 4S, due to the antics of electrostatic repulsion, we tend to fill up the 4S before the 3D. However, we have two very notable exceptions. The first of which is for chromium, which has a ground state uh, electron structure of argon. 
4S1 3D5. So essentially, now what I've done is I've lowered that uh, that those d orbitals enough that I can actually move the electron from the 4s to the 3d. So essentially, I can. Uh, the difference is such that by breaking the spin pairing energy of the four of the s orbitals, I get a net benefit, <clears throat> and I'll occupy the uh, the whole 3d set before I occupy the uh, the s orbitals. However, turns out by the time I get to manganese and I or iron and I add in an extra electron, well then I get spin pairing no matter where I go. So I tend to or so by the time I get to manganese, I spin pair the 4s uh, orbitals because that minimizes electron repulsion. So we're back to the normal idea: fill the s before the d's. However, this happens again. It turns out that it also happens for copper, which has a structure of 4s1, 3d10. Because again, at this point, the d orbitals become so much lower in energy than the s orbitals that even with equivalent spin pairing in both of these cases, we'll fill the d orbitals before we fill the s orbitals. And then again, by the time zinc, only place to go is fill up the s orbitals, and then we're on to the p block. So, it turns out, despite how often people talk about these system, uh, uh, talk about these systems, what actually causes the <coughs> 4s1 3d5 structure isn't the fact that we want a complete subshell. It's just actually a quirk and accident that it turns out that we just lower the d orbital energies enough at that point that d becomes more uh, more stable than s. It actually has nothing to do with wanting a complete subshell. Just a, uh, just a fun little coinkadink. So this brings us to the major idea of electronic filling. However, it turns out this has a lot of cool applications in the realm of that classic Gen Chem topic, periodic trends. So next time, we'll be talking about how these filling principles are felt with um, periodic trends. Until then. Take care.